Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. We have a lot to talk about and a lot to get through today. I got some city council, got some pre-critic. I got a highlighted episode of Dude, I Just Drew. I got some time-lapse video from the Stork Museum uh, historic Museum at Fort Missoula used book sale. Whew, that's a mouthful. Um, I also have a little uh, news and some weather. Uh, but I also have a guest here today, so I'm trying to get through the news and the weather as fast as possible so we can get her right in here. She's from Kidomatic, a film festival for kids um, that will be happening uh, November 14th to the 17th. We'll talk a little bit more about that when she comes on. So currently, 21 degrees outside. Your high is going to be 47. Your low is going to be 27. Uh, I thought it was going to be a little bit hotter today, especially with highs into the 50s, but you can expect to see most of that stuff happening this weekend on Saturday. Veterans Day, um, you're going to see some highs into the 44 degrees with a sunny outside. Uh, Ron Scholl, or Ron Scholl does a Veterans Day. He'll be at the, uh, the, um, the statue at the Vietnam Memorial outside of... Uh, uh, the courthouse on Monday to talk a little bit to uh, do the video. He does it every single year. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the news that are happening. Um, of course, Tuesday was election day, and a lot of city council members, the incumbents here in Missoula, won their awards. Gwen Jones won award three. Heidi West won award one. Murder Becerra had a very close race, winning award two with. Uh, a lot of things happening as well. Um, there's uh, Amber Shirell will be representing Ward 4. John Contos will be representing Ward 5. This is Sandra Vasecki, Ward 6. And the slim, of course, Sandra Vasecki's margin was one of the slimmest in Missoula with uh, 1,238 votes to 1,226 votes. So really slim margin right there. Um, also, the county of Missoula received $13 million build grant out of the $23 million they asked for. But County Chair Dave Stromayo says that this will move the project on the fast track. So here is uh, Dave Strohmeyer, if I can cue him up, and here he is. Grant, but folks, this is a big deal for Missoula and Missoula County. This is a transformative project. It's a way to get ahead of development in a way that we too infrequently do when communities grow. Oftentimes it's the case that infrastructure and investing in infrastructure follows behind the pressures of development. This is an opportunity for us with the help of the federal government as a partner to get out in front of the development that we see coming over the next two decades here in the Missoula Valley. All right, so the major uh, thing that's happening is that this infrastructure will help connect Mary Jane Boulevard, um, which is off Mullen Road, and it's going to help alleviate traffic both on uh, reser Reserve and Mullen, which is, uh, according to Missoula Department of Transportation, is the dangerous, most dangerous intersection in the state of Montana with over 48,000 cars a day. All right, so uh, more in the news, in state news, um, as if elections were uh, so really highly contested in Missoula, Helena, the could really not care. Uh, a whole ward was basically a write-in election. And one other uh, instance, Kit Johnson, who is uh, elected uh, as a write-in vote, he didn't even want the job. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next solution that they're trying to figure out is that perhaps the uh, the wards of in Helena City's Council will uh, have to vote and uh, have an interim uh, ward member. Um, which is not uncommon, but they'll need to figure out what they need to do with that as well. Uh, national news, uh, one of the biggest things that are happening in terms of animal cruelty justice is making its way through the Senate's office to the House of the, Pre to the uh, desk of the president. Um, animal cruelty would be considered a federal crime with up to seven years in prison and a fine. So the preventing, uh, it's the Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act, otherwise known as the PACT Act, is meant to correct a lingering oversight when Congress approved the Animal Crush Video uh, Prohibition Act in 2010. They wanted to update it to help cover uh, just general cruelty to animals as well. And so nine years later, it's finally being put there um, with a uh, basically bipartisan support. Um, the Human Society decided that the survey found 71% of domestic violence victims say that their abusers also targeted pets. There's a lot of studies even showing that uh, by hurting pets is always a prelude to a lot of um, uh, violence towards other humans as well. So uh, that's just kind of a big step in the direction to uh, put felonies. So. Of course, the, a lot of times, uh, it, the crush videos, for you, for those of you who don't know what a crush video is, it's basically there's a, a select group of people who like to watch uh, torture, watch people torture animals in videos. So that's one of the um, 
reasons which help propel this forward into uh, this newly passed bill. So we're going to see how this works out, and that's some of the news that are happening today as well. I have um, a video I want to show you guys, and it is from the um, used book sale. So, and then when I come back, I'm going to have Carrie on here to talk about uh, Kidomatic. <laughs> Everybody, we're here with Carrie Vache. Um, am Hi. I right? Uh, so, and you're the director of uh, Kidomatic at the Roxy Theater, which is going to be happening November 14th through the 17th. And what can people expect from this event? So, there's something for everybody. Uh, if you have a three year to six year old, there's movies on Friday, which is a no school day, Saturday, and Sunday that are great for kids. Uh, we have kids movies and then they go up into teenagers there's some cool g kids anime films uh the iron giant which is oh, a big favorite that's a fun one to throw that in and uh we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of a boy named charlie brown it has not um screened in theaters till this week so mm -hmm. we're jumping on that train too which will be cool and then there's even um one film called supermoto on Saturday night at 7.45 that is kind of a uh, older teenager adult movie. It's like for the people that like kids. Nice. And this is going to be, so there's a lot of movies happening this this week. That ne I think it's uh, it's next week, right? It's it's uh, the 14th, which is Thursday night. So we have a launch party at Cafe Dolce at 4 o'clock, and then we'll do movies then. And then Friday, the 15th, is a no school day. So all the parents who just figured that out, um, you can actually register for a stop motion animation camp we have going that day. You just call the Zach, they're running it for us. And then there's movies all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Wow, a lot of stuff going on at the Roxy Theater. Is there anything else that is happening uh, during Kidomatic as well? Um, you know, besides the camp, and then we have a stop motion lab that'll be in the Roxy lobby. So we'll have like a little diorama and a bunch of different scenes and Roxy Film Academy students and teachers will be there helping kids learn to make stop motion, making little movies, watching little movies, and maybe even playing with a few characters that you might have seen in the films. Nice. So if you want more information about Kidomatic, you can go to kidomatic.org. You could uh, check them out also. Probably there's a link on the Roxy Theater. Yeah, and you can buy tickets to everything on the Roxy Theater calendar. Yep. yep. Is there a special deal for people who buy like the whole ticket? Is like one ticket for the the whole entire weekend? Well, the only pass we're doing, so it's otherwise it's Roxy membership and discount.
discounts and ticket prices apply, but we are doing a Kidomatic Pass. So that's five punches for $20. You can bring lots of multiple kids. If you have five kids with you, you can bring all five of them to the movies and relax a little bit. Or you can also just use them individually and they'll carry over to Roxy Junior shows after Kidomatic. Nice. Well, thanks, Carrie. Thank is there anything know. else you wanted to mention before we go? Um, the only thing I would say is um, if you need to brighten your day, our Kidomatic trailer is really, really awesome. And you can look at that at kidomatic.org. It's right on the home page, and it will make you smile. Awesome. Well, yeah. thanks, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. All right, we'll be right back. Okay. Hello. Oh. You thought I was gone after our last challenge, but I'm back after destroying you with our Sharpie challenge last time. I'm here to destroy you at a new challenge, Mario Paint, a program from 1992 that was originally played on the Super Nintendo, which will now be played on my laptop with a 2001 Apple computer mouse. So it's going to be quite a challenge. No more pencils. For both, for both artists. Zero pencils, <laughs> one mouse, one, Mario. One wrist, one broken wrist. Yahoo! And particularly when you bring in tribal people, to, to look at what you've written and to make sure that you know their piece is is considered and I think that's kind of the hubris of I will speak for myself now me writing the book as a non-native and I'm hopeful that these books will lay the groundwork for a next chapter where we have Native American archaeologists writing the same story or different story the way they think that needs to be told Tammy has evolved as a 3D printed simplified anatomical model. He has more features to assist in teaching about seating and positioning concepts. The lumbar spine and legs below the knee joint are connected by multi-joint muscle groups with the pelvis caught in the middle. The pelvis, its position and movements ripple up the spine and have profound effects not only on lower body posture, but on how the shoulders sit on the rib cage, how the head sits on the neck, and what the eyes can see. There must be a good base of support for all these structures, beginning at the pelvis. Horses. Erica asked me if I wanted to go up to Flathead to pick up four new horses for this therapy ranch. And I was so excited, I said, of course I do. So it was me and Erica and her half-sister, Selena. We met the owner up there at this other ranch, and he said, go ahead and pick your horse. So I looked at all the horses, and I saw this beautiful, perfect horse. He was huge. He was brown and flowing mane. And I felt a little nervous, though. I knew it was important that we had to be able to trust each other. So I offered him my hand, and he sniffed my hand. He let me pet his nose. And I asked the owner, I said, what is this horse's name? He said, oh, the horse's name is Joe. And I said, well, that's really funny. My mom's name is Joe, so <laughs> apparently this is meant to be. This is a good connection. A lot going on, and there's a lot of movies coming out this weekend, so let's try to get through them as fast as possible. Kicking off your weekend is, yes, there's another Stephen King movie that's coming out this year. This has got to be like the fourth or fifth Stephen King adaptation of a movie uh, coming out just this year. He's having quite a resurgence. Hey, new technology, new cinematography, uh, angles. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. You can have a whole movie in Dutch angles. And uh, so basically, you remember The Shining? Yeah, the movie The Shining. So basically, this is a um, kind of a sequel based on the books, but also kind of based on the movie. So people aren't just like, wait a minute, didn't he die in that movie? Because he didn't actually die in the book, but he died in the movie. Anyways, so now um, Danny Torrance, he's an older guy. Daniel, he goes by. Um, he's kind of going through some tough times. He has The Shining, and uh, he meets another little girl who also has The Shining, and he has to help her with her Shining thing. And so there's a whole bunch of little correlations between the original movie and, of course, this new book, which is basically about an evil organization who's here to capture the Shining people. And it kind of feels like it 
possibly could be one of those um, teen um, post-apocalyptic, uh, be like, bleh, bleh, uh, teenagers, bleh, and all that stuff. But I don't know. I don't know. It's Obi-Wan. So, you know, if you like Obi-Wan, um, you, you'll like this movie, I guess. Um, moving on. Hey, you know, like, you like those uh, kind of like uh, romantic movies where they're just like, uh, it's like, I don't believe in love. And then they're just like, but I believe in love enough for the both of us. It's like, I love you because y your love has showed me the way, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of how this movie's going to be. So this is movie's Last Christmas. Um, it's basically, uh, she works at a, hel uh, a holiday store, uh, a, a Christmas store. Uh, if you want to call it that. Um, and she's a young 30-year-old lady. Um, in her efforts to not celebrate Christmas while working at a Christmas store, a man comes into her life and makes it better. Or she becomes better adjacent, but it shouldn't be because she's a man that's really good to her that she becomes better. She becomes better because she needs to become better for herself. So it's kind of a, she's growing out of her character. I don't know. It's kind of like one of those kind of like movies. So blah, blah, blah. All right, the next one. Uh, we got a military movie. It's the Battle of Midway, and uh, if you want to know what happens, so <laughs> you look it up, or if you went to school, you kind of know what happened. So it's a battle at, at Midway. This is the turning point of the war between Japan and America, because uh, America didn't just go to Nazi Germany for the war, just so you guys know. We also went on the Pacific. There's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of uh, water, submarine, um, aircraft carriers, kamikazes, all sorts of things happening going on there as well. So I suggest there's probably going to be a lot of the staples. There's going to be a lot of uh, both sides being like, it's just, I must fight for my country. And then they die for their country, and it's very patriotic and just kind of showing like how much you know people are just like, but I don't want to fight. I don't want to kill anyone, but, but I have to. And that's kind of like how a lot of those war movies have basically become lately, you know, the horrors of war. All right, so that's what you can expect from a lot of these movies as well, glamorizing a whole bunch of different things that are uh, happening as well. You know, that's what Hollywood does. Um, and so those are some of the movies that are coming out this weekend as well. I have... A dub and stuff for you guys, and I'm I'm actually particularly proud of this one. But without further ado, here is uh, "Please Murder Me." No, it's an actual movie called "Please Murder Me" from 1956. So I'm going to show you guys this, and when I come back, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some city council and some land use and planning because there's a lot going on. Boy, I tell you what, doesn't get any easier going up here on the stand, of course. Um, so uh, what's going on? <clears throat> in your own words, could you tell me a typical day in the life of you? Oh, why well, certainly. Uh, morning yoga, followed by the gym. You know, you always have to keep your uh, quads stretched before you go on the treadmill. Otherwise, you're going to go full hammy. Because last time I pulled a hammy, I gained like 50 pounds because <sighs> I was out of commission. Um, yes. Um, I'm asking more about in terms of the crime that was committed. Mm, well, it wasn't at the gym, I tell you what. <sighs> um... So, um, you look like you work out a lot. Perhaps if this trial ends up nicely, maybe we could work out together. Oh, I don't see why not. I'm always looking for an excuse to go to the gym. Do you have a certain area you want to work on? Uh, well, you know, the general gym atmosphere. Well, I guess free weights would be a good starting point for this. You know, a couple of machines and a couple other things. Oh, thank you. That would be very nice, actually. I have a very important question I need to ask you. Please, I need your complete honesty. Do I have a good mustache? Uh, well, it's hard to grow a mustache when you're blonde. Well, you can still see it, can't you? Well, it's more of a light skin tone and light hair tone. Have you thought about tanning? Because that works really well. You know, your skin gets darker, your hair gets lighter, and it really pops. I might have to try that. Thank you very much. What about lemon juice in your hair? Hmm, I've never tried that before, but thank you. All right, enough with the pleasantries. I noticed that you were talking about the plaintiff about working out and stuff. You look pretty cut. Would you uh, possibly want to hang out sometime? When this hearing is over, what do you think? We'd go out for a nice uh, cup of coffee. Then we'd probably go, oh no, I don't drink coffee, but thank you. I'm a more of an herbal tea kind of guy after all. I see you're more of a not read between the lines kind of guy. So, would you like to go out with me on a date? Oh, no, I, I, I really don't want to. I'm sorry if I led you on in any way. That was not my intention. Mm. I'm not a simple man, Mr. Smythe. I have feelings like everybody else. I put myself out there and get rejected on a regular basis. Not because I'm not handsome. So I will ask you again, under perjury of court, 
Am I attractive? Uh, no, I'm not attracted to you. <gasps> yeah, um, that was the movie that came out in 1956, and I just decided to redub it. All right, let's talk about some things that are happening within the city of Missoula. Uh, there's been a trend on the rise in the Missoula uh, city of Missoula with the uh, uh, correlation of the new uh, convention center, and they are having Nick Chakota. Uh, they made a deal to develop a fox site near the river uh, across from the hospital. Some people have been using this meeting as a platform to attack Nick and that city officials, saying that the tax increment financing is paying developers to develop. Uh, long story short, TIFs are meant to work with commercial developers and develop infrastructures and to help reduce blight in the area. Uh, such as water, sewer, sidewalk improvements, and giving them a tax credit upon completion. Uh, the Merck is a prime example of TIF funding. Um, Dan, from pre previous meetings, uh, spoke uh, on what he learned about TIFs and a little bit more about that as well. We were pleased and excited uh, to learn that the council responded directly to our concerns at the previous meeting. Uh, we took particular note of Councilman Von Losberg's point that TIF money has also contributed to a notable construction of low-income housing in the city. After our last two sessions of public comment, we've had the opportunity to learn more and more about tax increment financing. <coughs> Excuse me. And study the potential traps and pitfalls that might happen when urbanization strategies like this are employed and we just want to see them carried out carefully and responsibly. Um, we're, our response to Councilman Von Losberg's is to propose that even these types of development strategies fail precisely because they rely on development. See, cities they got the hots for development. Uh, they, they want as much development as they can get. In the current economic climate, it is the only way a mayor and a city council and appointed boards who serve the public interest can seem to mean, maintain political favor. Uh, they must locate, secure, and finance large-scale development projects to stay afloat. There's a debt-based economy that permeates government uh, funding on, on all levels. Um, and the precise reason everyone is broke is because the people in society who hoard the most money then siphon all they can out from the communities below them. To build. All right, so that was uh, Dan. I'll talk a little bit more about that. You can uh, see the whole comment also at the city council. But I wanted to talk it also another public comment about somebody who is a business owner in the city of Missoula who is reflecting on uh, these kind of devel developments are affecting his business. I want to grow with this community, and I think it's important to remember where we come from. There's three things you're not late for in Montana. That's work, church, and fishing. I've had a hard time going to work in the shadow of a looming future. I don't know. My girlfriend's leaving for better business opportunities, and I'm probably leaving when TechWorks gets torn down. I've known that the whole time, and I'm grateful for what I have. I think it's the duty of a city council to preserve that cool part of their city and also preserve the future for people that want to come and develop, because that's awesome, too. There's a lot of people stirred up about not getting their limelight and having it supposedly stolen by some larger entertainment business, and I don't know anything about that. I just know that if there's going to be a lot of money given that doesn't make a whole lot of sense where it's going, maybe we could allocate a way to synergize with the grassroots folks and give them a little space, make sure local, the local fund business attitude is preserved in Missoula, because I can't do what I want to do, and profit is not my main concern. I love Montana and con connecting with the heart of what Missoula is. All right, so that uh, was um, Dan uh, Cernick. Uh, he's a resident for 10 years. He runs the tech works in Missoula. Um, of course, I'm going to skip 
the end just a little bit because at the end of the meeting, a lot of uh, city council members have a more of a public forum to um, answer to a lot of these concerns that people had during the public comment section. So Jesse Ramos, towards the end of the meeting, uh, he talks uh, more about TIFFs about this, and he thinks that there should be more of a discussion within the community and within the city about how we want to perceive how we want to proceed with TIFFs. We've had more dialogue about this than I've ever heard in the community. We, we have more people talking about tax increment financing and having those discussions that I think we've been uh, deprived of for so long. I, I think that uh, it's been incredible what you guys have been able to do. Um, I've heard many folks um, in, in positions of, of power here in Missoula um, say that they're open to having a discussion on tax increment financing, but it just doesn't seem to happen. I mean, I've, I've been hammering tax increment finance, financing since I got on the council, and even when we've had Ellen Buchanan come in uh, and speak to us, it seems like there's always not enough time, or the questions that I have don't seem relevant to folks, or um, I, it seems like I'm just trying to target her. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to get the answers to these very complicated questions, and, and tax increment financing is different across all all uh, municipalities, but it's in it's present in all 50 states right now. And again, it, it was born in California, and it did um, die in California um, to an extent. I mean, it's resurrected, unfortunately, in, in some form or another. But nonetheless, a lot of these questions and, and these discussions are stymied by by comments like, "Well, the folks that are are speaking about tax increment financing don't really understand it, or we don't understand how it works really well." I remember when I first got on council during orientation, we went through um, a discussion on tax increment financing. Financing and and one of my fellow new council members asked, okay, so so we've heard some criticisms of tax increment financing, and um, the gal replied, she said, well, I think the only criticisms come from people that just don't understand it. I think that that's where it comes from, and I think that is the mindset that we have to try and overcome. I mean, everybody here in this audience has has demonstrated a tremendous amount of research and a tremendous amount of understanding over TIF, not just TIF overall, but even the specifics of how it's implemented in the state of Montana. All right, so um, I want to stop him right there. He talks a little bit more about this as well, but I wanted to uh, kind of refer back to this as well. There's definitely a lot of things happening in Missoula, and development is a big thing, and through TIF, a lot of the city wants to have some say in how the development's growing. Um, think about it as a, um, a like a wrench. Sometimes a wrench fits for a lot of different projects, and sometimes a wrench doesn't. Um, and th that's kind of how TIFFs work. Sometimes uh, TIFFs kind of seem like they're uh, a little too much for a lot of reasons, and then a lot of uh, not enough for a lot of different things as well. But a lot of people are starting to think that maybe TIFFs should be something that we should really start thinking about and start kind of reflecting on. Um, I mean, this is something that's kind of been uh, more of a recent thing, and Merck is a prime example of, of using TIF funds to help with uh, developing the site and the sidewalks around uh, the the uh, new Merck uh, building as well. And um, honestly, uh, just even thinking back, because uh, being a Missoula resident and kind of watching kind of things develop and things kind of change over time, there's urban renewal districts, which was the original attempt to uh, uh, decline a lot of blight in the area. And with, the, with what's been happening with the urban renewal districts is that there's been a couple of extensions that Jesse Ramos was not really happy about um, in the in the Missoula area, and and it's kind of like something that was passed many years ago, and it kind of follows Missoula as it goes along as well. Both TIFFs, there's a lot of things happening within TIFFs where it's like. Um, it's a lot shorter end when paying back a lot of those monies that were taken out for the TIFFs as well. So, uh, you know, think about it like this. Um, the uh, TIFFs are for the developers in that particular area where they're developing um, the new developments. Commercial, uh, it's been mostly uh, on as well, but there's been a lot of con controversy when it comes to residential and mixed uh, commercial residential areas as well. So that's something that uh, you definitely have to look into as things are going on as well. Okay, so one of the big things that are also happening, because this is more than just about TIFFs, but it's also about the city's master plan. And this is a good segue to the next place, which is called A Place Called Home, which is the down Missoula's downtown master plan, which will be implemented in the next couple of years, slowly get it in there, and it will be looked upon until uh, basically 2035 when they'll have a brand new master plan, depending upon where Missoula is at at that particular time. So Linda McCarthy, Downtown Partnership, uh, talks about what people... Uh, who went to these focus groups. So this is an open forum. There's a lot of focus groups in the city of Missoula for over a year uh, for this plan, our Missoula, place called home and all this stuff, the downtown master plan. This is a lot of public input. Uh, Linda McCarthy uh, respond, like reflects on the, uh, the many people getting involved with the process of downtown master planning. 
This plan is a big picture, forward thinking, 10 year community vision for the heart of Missoula. It is centered around people and place. It shows strong passion and ownership of downtown by all Missoulians. It is creative, professional, and a community oriented plan. The areas of focus are land use, infrastructure, downtown housing, parking and transportation, street design standards, retail and commercial business development, and inclusivity. So that last one, inclusivity, is a very main staple of what a lot of these uh, downtown master plans are all about, trying to figure out how to grow, but also still seem kind of small enough for people to be able to kind of like enjoy what they're seeing. A lot of times, uh, Missoula City of Missoula is trying to avoid those multi-giant apartment complexes, which look obviously uh, g very dis disgusting, very ugly, that a lot of people want to avoid seeing about like five, six story buildings with a bunch of apartments, 64 plus units and all that stuff. So that's one of the things that this thing, a place called home, which is community driven, wants to avoid as well. Uh, there are 10 organizations that approved this as well. There's a lot of businesses, people, and other things. The final step is the city's approval. Uh, this has been pushed through the county commissioners helping this move forward. This, uh, this has been years in the making. This process includes how to connect our current residents and future residents on how they want their town to look in the future. Byron Von Lossberg is hopeful for this plan to move forward, and this is what he had to say. No plan uh, is perfect, particularly a plan of this size and dealing with the complicated uh, sort of things that it has to deal with. Um, it's a visionary sort of plan. Not everything will come to fruition uh, in, the pl in that plan, and not everything will come to, uh, to pass uh, in a fashion that the plan envisions. Um, that's exactly consistent with what happened with the first downtown master plan from, from 10 years uh, prior. So um, with that, it's a process that I'm uh, proud of, thanks to all the people that made it work, uh, and I'm happy to support it, and I hope you will as well. Of course, I've been saying this a lot in a lot of the meetings, is that uh, the, the group, uh, uh, which is uh, Dover Coal and Partners, said that um, Missoula it had a, one of the highest per capita of people interested in being involved with the downtown master plan with over 3,600 people in the city of Missoula, which doesn't seem big because Missoula is like 78,000 people. But uh, compared to places like Miami, which has over basically 400,000 people in the Mi Miami area, um, only 3,000 people out of the – so that's basically uh, 3% of that population, while in Missoula it's more just like uh, – probably more like 10% of Missoula really had a lot of input when it came to how the downtown master plan was going to be. So this plan uh, was officially approved by the city council, but adoption will take its time with the process and implementing it as well. But there's also always a bunch of other things that are happening in place that I'm going to allude to back to this, a place called home, because the downtown master plan is already affecting developers in the long run, especially with the Hellgate Meadows and the $13 million uh, build grant that happened with the infrastructure changes of Mary, Mary Jane Boulevard. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I also want to change gears and talk about open space. Open space is something in the city of Missoula that uh, was voted uh, by the people in the city of Missoula to uh, promote open space and connectivity. One of the biggest things is that they're looking to spend 775000 of the 2018 open space uh, proceeds for the Clark Fork River Sustainable Access and Restoration Project, Reforestation Project, and Conservation Lands Trailhead Improvement Project. So there's a lot going on here. Morgan Valiant with Open Space spoke on Waterworks, which is the biggest thing that they want to tackle as soon as they get approval. For 100,000 people a year that access this site, it's never been formally built uh, to actually accommodate parking or education or sustainable trail access or ADA access to our open space lands. Um, this project, uh, we are requesting $135,000, up to $135,000 in open space bond funds uh, to get the engineering, surveying, permitting, um, and then a lot of our design of our on-site interpretation and construction oversight. Uh, this is a $605,000 project, so uh, the majority of this project uh, is funded. 
All right, so uh, Morgan Valiant, he talked a little bit more about having uh, access to Waterworks Hill. Waterworks Hill is a trail that was on private, uh, adjacent to private property, and it was open up for people just to go up on Waterworks Hill. And now what they're trying to do, since the city acquired the water company, that they wanted to do is build a more on-site deal where you just drive up there, and what you do is you just kind of park and then you can walk around at Waterworks Hill. There's a lot of open space and they want to invite people to be able to come up there and also have easy access, especially people who are living with a disability. Um, so that's one of the things that are happening as well. Jesse Ramos uh, was very concerned about open space bonds, about how the city of Missoula is acquiring land and not developing it, um, even though that development is a big thing that's happening in Missoula of Montana. But this is what he had to say in reflection uh, to a lot of these new projects. Impressed with Morgan's work since the passage of this. I think he's done a tremendous job. Um, one of my main hesitations with putting the open space bond on the ballot in the first place was that we were going to, to purchase a bunch of land that was primed for development, further driving up the cost of, of property um, or of property in the city of Missoula and also with the city becoming a land baron. I didn't want to see that happen. With this particular um, expenditure, not, nothing like that happens. Um, it it um, is, is solely being used to increase the accessibility of the open space lands, which I think is great. We have far too many open space lands uh, in America right now that are public lands that the people don't have access to right now. And I think that the fact that we're doing this uh, is great. And to speak to Ms. Anderson's point and Ms. Jones's point that um, helping to, to put this investment in the trails and the infrastructure with the proceeds of this bond, again, it, it's going to only help preserve the land uh, to keep people on those trails so that people aren't kind of going off, making their own game trails, um, disturbing the wildlife, and, and further creating erosion. So just wanted to briefly state I'm, I'm incredibly in support of this uh, motion, and thank you again, Morgan, for your great work and grant as well. All right, so open space has kind of turned into something that's been very supportive by uh, many people on the city council moving forward. And uh, without, you know, like, um, this was approved by city council, and they will move forward on many th projects in the future, connecting trails, improving the trails, and also putting up signs, and so making sure that people remain on trails and uh, don't disturb the land. So that's kind of what's happening with that happened within the city council. There's definitely a lot going on with development as well. And speaking of development, land use and planning, it's all about that rezoning stuff. And a lot of people are concerned about rezoning because by rezoning a, a certain partial of land to a certain degree, there's still the other areas that's not developed that could be developed into something that could be very bad for a lot of residents of the Skyview neighborhood, which is located on 9th Street West. And uh, this approval of the project would get started in summer of next year. Um, Malcolm Lowe, who is a resident of the 9th Street, uh, feels this process is opening a can of worms. What you're doing in essence, if you move ahead with this, is saying, oh, we actually are going back on that decision. For this 0.8 acres, we feel it's okay. I don't feel it's okay, and I think you should really examine that process. Is it asking so much to have Mr. Burkhalter reapply for just the pieces he's going to use. You have already communicated to the Board of the Housing that you will, with a straw vote, that you can do this, that you want this. Is it asking so much to redo that process, have him just rezone the pieces that he's intending to develop into this affordable housing project? I think it's a perfectly reasonable request. I think that this body can communicate to the Board of Housing that it's going forward. He'll keep his funding. He's got two years to use that money. I think that that would be the prudent thing to do. I think to ask us to assume the risk for that 0.8 acres that could be any 30 units of something else, and it's even more tucked away on a dead end street, I think that's really unwise zoning. All right, so that was um, Malcolm Lowe uh, uh, speaking. Um, so one of the biggest things is residents of his existing neighborhoods to pay for the sidewalks. Um, elderly folks need sidewalks. The Skyview Apartments is a big uh, project that they want to build, build uh, mini units for. Um, it's going to be three stories, and they want to have like about 60 units for uh, elderly folks who are usually single-dwelling elderly folks. Um, and, they, um, and one of the things is that sidewalks aren't cheap. In the city of Missoula, I, I did a, a shoot for Walk and Roll Week, and one of the things is that when I was over at um, Lions Park area uh, filming their sidewalk kind of tour and whatnot is that they got a grant with a lot of money, but basically a mile of sidewalk is roughly $850,000 for about a mile of sidewalk to be constructed. So that's just kind of like one of the things that many people are concerned about, and Julie Marriott, um, 
with the city council response to Malcolm and others about the sidewalks in these particular areas. All that taken into consideration, we still have a desperate need for affordable housing and especially for senior housing. Uh, we have so many seniors that are currently waiting for a decent housing and uh, as we've heard from the proponents who came and testified about this, the beneficiaries of the proposed development are going to be seniors that are um, just below or at the median income level. Um, and the, the neighbors who have spoken out with our concerns seem largely similar, just regular Missoulians. And it, this has been a particularly difficult decision because there's, there's no bad guys here. I mean, um, it's, it's trying to balance some really challenging needs in our community. Um, the fact remains that the neighborhood desperately needs infrastructure uh, beyond the confines of what will get constructed as part of this project. Um, I have already asked the mayor, uh, the head of public works, and the head of our transportation planning organization to come up with a plan. Um, to address the real lack of infrastructure in this neighborhood, and I totally agree with Mr. Lowe that that should not come on the backs of those existing property owners. Um, in, in my mind, that's one way that we need to help spread um, the, the burden, if you will, of the infill that's happening in our neighbor, neighborhoods. Um, we, we can't just have all the sidewalks built on the backs of the existing property owners. So I'm going to continue to work with our <coughs> staff to try and um, figure out how we do prioritize that infrastructure in this neighborhood. All right, so that's kind of what's happening. Um, a lot of the responses from um, the city council, but Heidi West actually speaks that this is uh, a lot of times this is uh, more than uh, what the neighborhood wants, but it's about the community. I'm thinking about home ownership. How it is one of the few ways that we have as a society to both build wealth and pass it on to future generations. How much security it provides and what an amazing asset it is in creating upward mobility. Some of us are fortunate enough to have the opportunity to purchase a home. The reality is that some members of our societies are never afforded that opportunity. And that is true here in Missoula where half of our community is composed of renters. Being a homeowner does not make an individual more deserving and being a renter does not make an individual less deserving of a home that is affordable and allows a person to age in place. So um, with that, I support this project and I understand that it has, you know, it's not perfect, um, but the reality is that it fulfills a neighborhood need or a community need and that all of us in all neighborhoods um, need to be a part of the solution. All right, so that was uh, Heidi West uh, talking a little bit about that. Uh, the, so, so the city moved forward on this uh, for the consent agenda on Monday. Um, most of the meetings that happen on Wednesdays uh, with the land use and planning those committee meetings is that these are uh, more detailed stuff, talking a little bit more about this. Um, a lot of times they go back to committee and then they go forward to be on the city council's consent agenda. So this is going to be back on, on Monday's consent agenda, but not next Monday. It's going to be happening the week after, which is the 18th, um, after because the next Monday's Veterans Day. Um, the rest of the land use and planning was devoted to that Mary Jane Boulevard. Uh, of course, I talked a lot about this early on in the project, um, and this is uh, one of the things that are uh, happening in the city of Missoula. Uh, Jeremy King with the City Public Works talked about uh, the rezoning, which is necessary in uh, this infrastructure update. Um, the strategy recognizes that neighborhoods have unique, unique needs, and as we grow as a community, we must develop thoughtfully in a way that is sustainable and equitable while maintaining community quality. Throughout this growth, no neighborhood should be asked to experience radical change. Consequently, no neighborhood should be exempt from change either. So that's really what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to strike that balance. So with the Hellgate Meadows rezoning, um, the existing zoning, the existing growth policy don't get us there. It, it doesn't allow mixed use. It allows limited multifamily, and it doesn't have a density, it doesn't allow a density that really supports that transit and walkability and mixed use that, that we think we want. Um, the, the new zoning, the proposed zoning, creates some uncertainty because it allows a lot more density than maybe what's being contemplated. So the development agreement is the way we're balancing that. 
Yeah. All right. So a lot of times uh, people uh, try to uh, figure out a way to make this work. This is a compromise between neighborhood impacts and community needs. The city plans to move forward on the Mary Jane Thruway and develop it rather than uh, the issues that England Boulevard has when they connected it through Reserve. This infrastructure uh, big is a big deal with that. This is kind of like just as they're learning that they got the $13 million grant. Um, so this is, this is kind of happening before uh, they got that grant. And so they're trying to figure out the rezoning to help uh, determine what uh, some of the uh, things are happening. Uh, but with the development, they want to plan on developing at a certain pace that won't uh, directly um, majorly impact the area as well, otherwise known as the Hellgate Meadows development that they want to do. Um, resident Lori uh, Fligger is concerned that, w that the city's new master plan conflicts with this neighborhood. Um, so this is what she had to say. Go with a development agreement. You are letting developers plan for the future. You're not looking at the zoning. When you did the zoning and the growth plan, that was with community input. That was people spending a lot of time. Actually, Mr. Kaufman, I believe, was on the steerage committee. So I find it interesting that people who made a growth plan and said, this is the way we want this developed and this is the density, then change it when the developers don't like it. And they can come kind of behind the scenes and put forth a development plan instead of following the regular zoning rules. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, so that was... Uh, um that was uh, Lori Fligger. Um, so uh, Nick Kaufman, one of the developers working in this area, has been concerned himself about development. He wants to uh, create uh, an aesthetic in the neighborhood that matches a lot of the other buildings, but also be able to connect it and make the uh, the fire lanes a lot wider for fire trucks to go through. Um, the, the, a lot of the uh, sites in this residential area that already exists are, uh, are already of concern of him when developing forward on these new 57.5 acres as well. Um, so a lot of, uh, and also uh, developing wall in the middle, uh, in the midst of the downtown master plan update as well is also a struggle as developers are trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, and also having a certain amount of um, a number cap. And one of the things that they wanted to do is that they wanted to place the higher density off of Mary Jane Boulevard, kind of like having a kind of like a row of um, higher density. But this is a, uh, basically eight attached townhouse, which is the maximum cap that they're putting it at. And they want to keep this closer to the Mary Jane Boulevard areas, while also when they're building out further into the more of the residential side, they want to have more of that single family lot houses as well, detached, of course. Um, so that's kind of what their plan was moving forward with this. Um, but right now, infrastructure is a big thing that's happening with there as well. And this is going to be continued to be talked about uh, since the addition of the $13 million has changed the timeline overall with development. Um, so there's a lot going on here as well. The city uh, did not move forward on putting this on any consent agenda. So they're going to be con continue to discuss this back and forth. There's a lot of moving parts. And especially with this whole $13 million build grant, there's going to be a lot happening as well. Whew. All right. There's a lot happening in the city of Missoula. And uh, I do have a uh, highlight video from Dude I Just Drew. Um, I, I have about, about 10 minutes left, and this should cover a good chunk of that minute. So here is highlights from the latest episode of Dude I Just Drew, which aired last Saturday. We plan on hopefully uh, have uh, uh, Firazaki. He is a, uh, a fairly well-known um, Instagram um, uh artist hopefully will be on sometime this month as well he's going to be coming up all the way from the east coast uh just to challenge rowan it's crazy so uh, hopefully we will we'll get him on sometime this month um and he's literally just coming to missoula just to uh hang out with rowan and do some art stuff so <laughs> that'll end well anyway, so without further ado here's uh jaden martell a guest that versed rowan lemus on dude i just drew Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another new episode of season two of Dude I Just Drew. Uh, introducing Uncle Jaden. Yes. Yeah, that's about it. That's about his name. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was not going to be with that short intro. Let's get right on. Into the news. Yeah, the news of the rules. The <laughs> <laughs> okay. news right, of so the rules. Never done this before, so just kind of run me through what we're doing. Yes. Uh, so. We get both each get five minutes to draw. Okay. We take one suggestion to draw. We're both going to draw the same suggestion. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> five rounds. Okay. About five. Five rounds. Coin toss. Five minutes. Yes. 
I said five minutes. Five minutes to draw. Oh. I said five, 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 five minutes. That's really cool. Five rounds. We should get five minutes. Okay. That's ten minutes total. All yes. Right. And, um, yeah. Great. A suspicious looking cube. I can do that. That's that that's a suspicious effort. I yeah. A yeah. suspicious looking cube guys. By the way, if my hands are bloody, it's because they're cold. My hands don't get cold, they just get cracked and bloody. It's kinda disgusting. Uh, don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> don't don't. <laughs> don't don't do drugs, guys. <laughs> he is in the mountains of Asia. Whoa. The Himalayas? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, is he what holding an unknown substance as well? <laughs> He's holding an unknown Is he holding other my cube? cube? <laughs> <laughs> 3D paper? Oh, what the Our heck? Five-dimensional paper. I'm trying to wrap your brain around that. <laughs> Wait, wait, 3D paper. Wait, does that mean like fold origami? Well, Can I fold the paper into origami? Would that count? You have to drew it. You have to draw it to be true. Mm. Let's just draw a bunch of random things. <laughs> 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 it's Graham, guys. <laughs> a really long torso. <laughs> or that pretty much the winner of the year. <laughs> oh, this is paper. <laughs> Are you drawing it? <laughs> I was in the middle. <laughs> Mega Ocean versus Mount St. Helens. <laughs> Mega Ocean? Mega Ocean. Mega Ocean versus Mount St. Helens. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, yes, big muscles. <laughs> yeah, he's got big muscles. Mm -hmm. No. Iowa. <laughs> Lenny. <laughs> Why did you speak in Spanish? Yeah, Spanish with a Japanese accent. Como se dice? Como se dice? Oh, he has, he has way too much. Master Ocean. Um, he, he, needs, he needs. Oh, he needs big muscles too. No, no, he needs big muscles. He needs the muscles. I don't have time. I don't have the time. Oh. Oh, no. no! I was, I was way no, too complicated. I, like seriously, like, 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 how did just like produce a bunch of ass ash? <laughs> so that's already really good. <laughs> so here's my Master right there is gender fluid. Probably, oh, he is fluid. Dude, really? <laughs> 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 Oh. Sorry, I just had to. I, now I need to throw something at you. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Atlantis in space. What? Is that, is that like a like an, oh, like a superior being? <laughs> it's looking up. Imagining Atlantis? <laughs> you just dug something from the depths of my mind. Uh, Simpsons. <laughs> I don't know why my face and everything felt a little fuzzy for a second, and I was like, "Are you okay? Yeah." Do you need like do you smell toast? Are you having a stroke? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It really reminds me of Jack Kirby, kind of style, doesn't it? Like yeah, the blocky, the blockiness of it. it. It reminds me of Jack Kirby. It's a crab and lobster dance off. <laughs> Mr. Krabs and Larry the Lobster <laughs> looking like Larry and Mr. Yeah. Krabs. <laughs> okay. Sure. What are you doing? You're just scrapping it. You're gonna draw it as fast as you can. Yes. Huh? So we're just both going to be doing um, the Crabster dance. It's <laughs> me, Larry Lobster. I like how I like how different I like how different he looks. I know. Does he wear speedo? Kind of. Kind of. I think so. I don't remember what he looks like. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> they parted. They remember. parted a bit too late. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what Larry looks like. It's been forever since I've drawn Spongebob, but I do know, I just remember the fact that his body has body type. <laughs> And he's, and he's like, and he's like... It's like more of a triangle shape. I made him more of a rectangle. This kind of feels like the Hamlet version of Larry the Lobster. So <laughs> there, there, there they are. They're having a dance off with their partner. They have their partners no, together. No, no, their they're dance off looks like <laughs> they're in love. <laughs> they're in love. <laughs> This dance right. off turned I mean, into a romantic dance. I mean, look at so loving mm. at the other crab. It's just Look like... at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> baby, look into my eyes, baby. Well, thanks for having me on. Yes. That was, that was really fun. Do you want to promote yourself for any, like, anything? Like, do you if, have anything? If you live in the Seattle area, come buy a car for me. Remember, you can follow me at Instagram on nowhere.arts. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at nowhere exclamation mark. Okay. Uh, go to Dude I Just Drew the website. Go to Dude I Just Drew Spreadshirt if you want to get some cool shirt designs. Um, remember, we have a Facebook. If you want to check us out uh, elsewhere, this video out along with the highlights, go to YouTube. Yeah. My Instagram is Martel Automotive. It's Martel with two L's. So that, that's that's about it. All right. Yeah, I don't. I'm not on social yes. media enough. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right, guys. Well. Great, another great episode. Until next time. Until next time, guys. See you later. Bye. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about um, there's a, there was a concert at the MCT. Uh, we did a live stream not so long ago, but I wanted to remind folks at home, in case you missed it and you were really excited about watching it, you could always watch it on our website. Um, it's at MCAT.org. If you are missing it, 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 it there was a concert on, uh, I believe it was a Monday. We tried to live stream it. Uh, there were some issues with our live stream. So if you go to MCAT.org, you go to watch channel 189, and you can see from the website right here that you have the Sousa Centennial Celebration Concert. This concert was sold out, so a lot of people were wanting to find a way to watch it. All you got to do is click on the concert itself and you can see a little taste of the Sousa Centennial Celebration Concert. So without further ado, um, MCAT.org, watch channel 189, boom, this link, and then go to the Sousa Centennial Celebration Concert. All right, so those are where you can get a, uh, watch some of the programs. It's usually updated for the more recent programs that just get uploaded to our website as well. There's a lot of stuff going on in the city of Missoula. Uh, there, I don't really have too much time for the events today, but I did want to say that this weekend there is a lot of bazaars. Uh, not the not bizarre, kind of like weird, but uh, crafts fair, a bunch of things happening. I'll just give you a quick little rundown of some of the places as well that you guys can go to. You can go to the Big Sky High School, which they're doing an SOS uh, holiday sale. They got the St. Paul Lutheran Church, which is 202 Brook Street. They hold, have the Holy Spirit. It's... Uh, ooh. Pescapalian, oh my god, uh, it's going to be the Holy Spirit Church, I'm just going to say that because I'm not going to butcher it anymore, it's off of uh, 130 South 6th Street, and you can check those out as well, there's a bunch of other events of it happening as well, and if you want more information, go to MissoulaEvents.net to find all your event needs and more, but I also just wanted to quickly just kind of go over some of the uh, events that are happening. Also, the winter market is on Saturday. It starts at 9 a.m. and it's at the Missoula Senior Center. But also, check the basement of the Missoula Senior Center. That's usually where they have their thrift store. They're going to have a bunch of booths. They'll have some music. Just go to the best dance floor in the city of Missoula at the Missoula Senior Center. Okay, so I think that about does it. I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. I want to thank Carrie from uh, Kidomatic Film Festival, uh, November 14th through the 17th. They're going to have movies geared towards kids. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time at the Roxy Theater as well. You can go to roxytheater.org for more information, or you can go to kidomatic.org as well. So for uh, Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Mm -hmm.